Hello, I'm Matthew Davis. Welcome to World Business Report. Today we're in Morocco, perhaps the most stable country in the Arab world. This corner of northwest Africa is looking to become the gateway for investment flowing into the continent. Understanding of the African continent's modus operandi positioned them very favorably to tap into the huge potential of the upcoming economic and demographic boom. But like many countries in the region, it has a restless population, eager for political and economic reform. Patience is running out in Morocco. And so given the level of frustration and grievances, if nothing is done, we can witness a second wave of protest soon. And I'm Will Bain in London, where we'll be bringing you up to speed on all the latest from around the financial markets. That's all coming up over the next half hour. Welcome to a very hot and sunny Morocco. I'm in Marrakesh, the Red City, as it's often called, because of the red sandstone from which the walls around it are built. We're at the foot of the Atlas Mountains here in a thousand-year-old city that's home to narrow streets and souks, as well as Jamalfra, the busiest market square in Africa. And the hustle and bustle of this unique place is overlooked by the Kotubi Ar Mosque, built at the end of the 12th century. But it's not just about what you can see here. Marrakesh is a feast for all the senses, from the smells of the tagines and pastillas being cooked in the restaurants and cafes, to the noise of the traders plying their wares in the city's 18 souks or market, where you can buy anything, from pottery and leather sandals to carpets and live chickens. We're in the Clock Cafe in the Casbah, quite close to the Royal Palace. Princes, Hollywood actors, as well as local Moroccan rappers have all eaten here, where the speciality is a camel burger. But our particular road to Morocco didn't start here in Marrakesh. It began more than 200 kilometers to the northwest by the Atlantic coast in Casablanca. <laughs> Casablanca is a completely different place. Its chaotic traffic and seemingly endless urban sprawl gives it the feeling of a city on the move, one which the locals have dubbed the Beast. A major upgrade to its main roads means many are closed, diverted or narrowed, so the traffic jams can often rival those in a city like Nairobi. At almost every street corner, a new building is going up. Not for Casablanca, the exquisite minarets and palaces and the magical medieval alleyways of Marrakesh. This is the thumping heart of the Moroccan economy. On the face of it, the Moroccan economy seems robust. It exports agricultural products and textiles. The carmaker Renault has a huge plant in the north and the country has the only high-speed rail link in Africa. It's also home to 70% of the world's phosphate reserves, which are used to create fertilizers, while Casablanca has a technology and entrepreneur hub that can rival any on the continent. And the Moroccan government is busy promoting itself as a gateway for investment into Africa. Nabila Friji is the vice president of CGEM, the Confederation of Businesses in Morocco. I think Morocco has been blessed by history and geography it is at the crossroads of continents, cultures, and civilizations. And, and it has made considerable efforts to attract foreign investment. One specific sector that experienced outstanding growth is automotive. The car factories of Renault in Tangier and Peugeot in Canitra will reach a total of 700,000 cars produced yearly. So Moroccan understanding of the African continent's modus operandi positioned them very favorably to tap into the huge potential of the upcoming economic and demographic boom. Do you think that the Arab Spring scenarios that happened in a lot of countries in the rest of North Africa, do you think that Morocco will largely avoid that and in a way attracts money into North Africa because it's quite stable. Morocco is, is a very pacific country. 
it has had smooth transition. The political stability is uh, definitely something that attracts FTIs, definitely. For us as businesses, it's, it's, it's very important. Generally speaking, would you say that the Moroccan economy itself is in good shape? I would say that we have uh, made big strides in the last 20 years. Much effort were, was put in the infrastructure, increasing the productivity, enhancing the competitiveness of the industries. But at the same time, we haven't succeeded yet. And we need to give the population and youth new skills that enhance their competitiveness in a global economy. And you need to have world-class skills. It certainly convinced the likes of Luxembourg, which last week announced it was opening a trade and investment office in Casablanca. The EU country's Deputy Prime Minister, Etienne Schneider, was on a visiting trade mission along with 50 companies. I see a bright future for the African continent in general because uh, they have something we are lacking in Europe and that's uh, well-trained, well-formed young people and quite a lot of them. The uh, logistics sector is quite an important sector in Luxembourg due to our geographic situation in the heart of the European Union. And now we want to discuss about uh, using the, the port of Tangier as our entry port to the northern African continent. And uh, I think that uh, our logistics companies both sides will have a bright future in, in doing so. You know, when we choose uh, Morocco for being our entry gate uh, to the African market, it was due to the fact that the political situation is very stable. Politics are quite moderate. So, you know, that's something which is really important for investors. But step away from the tall glass buildings of downtown Casablanca, that's the financial and business center of Morocco, and it's a different story. <laughs> Since 2007, I have struggled to find work. The main reason is the structure of the job market. There are hardly any fixed-term contracts. There are short-term contracts, and you are not guaranteed to have a stable job. So, since 2007, I have not had any stable work. There is no companies for the young generations. I have been in the field since 2007. I worked for a year and a half in three or four jobs at the same time, but I was still on a low salary, even lower than the minimum wage. This is a problem. A lack of jobs and access to decent health care and education regularly brings people out onto the streets in protest. Like many African countries, Morocco has a youthful population, but unemployment for those under 25 is estimated to be over 40%. And there's a perception at the Mahzen, a local term which loosely translates as the establishment or the elite, control and reap most of the benefits from the economy. The Human Development Index ranks Morocco below its neighbours Algeria and Tunisia. And Oxfam claims it's the most unequal society in North Africa. But Morocco has avoided the whole-scale revolutions that have gripped this region in the recent past. The Arab Springs, which fermented violent unrest, regime collapses and outright civil wars across North Africa, haven't happened here. But for some, like Mohamed Mashbar, director at the Moroccan Institute for Policy Analysis, it could happen. Patience is running out in Morocco, and so I am not a prophet to predict, but I can say, given the level of frustration and grievances, if nothing is done, we can witness a second wave of protest soon. That clearly wouldn't be what the government and the authorities and the elite would want because that revolution endangers them. Exactly. So, as I said, political and economic reforms is a necessity for the survival of the regime itself. So for but there have been reforms over the years. That's correct. That in 2011, there was a response. But people now see that they are waiting so that the constitution and the political reform of 2011 will bring about more development, more stability, more jobs for youth. But it seems that this model has failed to achieve this. So for now, there is a need to 
rebuild trust in the political system and in the political elite to bring about political reform, but also long-term economic reforms. Now there is kind of, I would say, blockage or something not, things are not moving. Meanwhile, for others like Professor Mohammed Shatu at the University of Mohammed V, the prospect of an Arab Spring in Morocco is remote. The government would always listen to what's happening in the street and make changes to its policies, which means there is some, some form of uh, democracy between brackets and the government will follow what's happening in the street if there is strong pressure and if this pressure is mounting, then it will change its policies. That's and not a bad to... thing, though, is it? I mean, if the elite of this Mahzen and the people's frustrations on the streets and are maybe slowly doing something about it, uh, this is not a bad thing. They're not completely cut off. No, the, I don't think there is, uh, the, the government is completely cut off from the, the street, no. If it were the case, it would not be around. When you come to Morocco, it looks like a monologue. But in fact, it's a dialogue. The other, you don't see the face of the other side, but the other side is there listening carefully to what's going on behind veil or behind a curtain and you make changes and you don't have to appear in public and to show that you are making concessions, but you do make concessions. It's that quite a game of brinkmanship though, isn't it? It's, a, it's quite a risky strategy. It is, but so far it did not lead to, to revolution. There are some rays of light in contrast with the dark side of the political economy. At Casablanca near Shaw Park, a technology and entrepreneurial hub, unemployed graduates are being taught new skills like computer coding to make them more attractive to prospective employers. My name is Fatem Zahra. I'm 24. I have a master's degree in environmental engineering. I struggled to find a job for about one year. After that, I decided to switch to another field uh, till the point that I find this training with EFE Morocco. Sometimes I feel sad about this. I put a lot of energy for getting this diploma, but I see that I have a chance now to work, to have a job. I ask the government of Morocco to make more opportunities like this it will help a lot of people and it will change their lives. Tu les auras. Il va refaire une requête. Maintenant, la question qu'on se pose, c'est comment faire en sorte d'avoir... Jihan Lababi Barada is the chief executive of Education for Employment Morocco, the NGO that runs the courses these students are taking. For her, when it comes to supporting young people in their search for work, it's all about hope. Most, I would say, need some career guidance. Some have absolutely no clue how to start, where, where to start. Some just send one or two applications. They don't hear back from the employers and they believe that the whole world is against them. So there's a lot of um, personal development and self-help that we are trying to instill into our trainings. I have all it takes to find a job. I have the talent, but I, I haven't had necessarily the opportunity. The talent is within myself. You sound very optimistic. Are you optimistic about the future? I am very optimistic about the future because um, we see that these youth have tremendous potential. Talent is universal, but opportunities are not, and it's up to us to provide those opportunities to those underserved and underconnected youth and women. The method is easy. We'll see how we make a request on that. Okay? Bon, okay. voilà. We'll do the pause. And that was Jahan Lababi Berada from the Education for Employment Morocco. Here in Marrakesh, both the weather and the Moroccan mint tea are hot. And speaking of tea, I'm joined now by Mohamed Baroudi. He runs a company called City Tea here in Marrakesh. And among other things, they, sew, they hand sew tea bags, which are then filled with leaves and then export to the rest of the world. Hello, Mohamed. Hi, hello. 
tell us a little bit about your company. What, what is exactly what you do? Yeah, so our company was founded 40 years ago by my father. It's still a family business uh, until now. And we are specialized in packing tea, premium tea, luxury tea, in luxury packaging. And our main product is the stitch, hand-sewn uh, cotton tea bags. So basically they are uh, uh, tea bags made out of cotton, so a natural, uh, natural cotton, and they are stitched by hand in our factories. We employ over 1,000 people for this, uh, for this task of uh, stitching tea bags, and we produce over 1.5 million tea bags every day. So obviously tea isn't grown in Morocco, so yeah. you import the tea from places like China and Kenya and Africa and Rwanda, yeah. then you fill these, uh, these, these Muslim tea bags uh, full of tea, yeah. uh, and then you export them. Um, so you kind of import, export, and manufacturing. What, uh, what are the particular challenges of running such a business in Morocco? Yeah, I, I want to say that we have a double challenge. We are based in Morocco, and we import almost all our raw materials because, as you said, there is no tea in Morocco. And the uh, other challenge is that we are based in Marrakech, so inland. So we are a three hours drive from the closest port in Casablanca. So we have this uh, logistic uh, uh, issue uh, with uh, having to bring our, all our production from Marrakech to the port to Casablanca. And this is one of the toughest part of our the logistic chain we have. But uh, the, our whole organization uh, was built to manage this complexity. And we've been uh, dealing with this complexity for over 40 years now. So it's not an issue anymore. This is not uh, what keeps us uh, awake late at night. Thank you, Mohamed. You're with World Business Report from the BBC World Service. Now let's go to London to find out what's been happening on the financial markets. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And we're all hoping in the studio here that some of that tea comes back uh, with you there. More from Matt and his guests in Morocco very shortly. But one of the most read stories at the moment on the BBC website is the trouble for the US fashion retailer Forever 21. Rachel Winter is Associate Investment Director at Killick Co. She joins us live. Afternoon, Rachel. Afternoon. And it's filed for what's called Chapter 11, sort of reorganisation bankruptcy in the US. Yes, it has. Yeah, so bad news for the retail sector here. Forever 21 has about 800 stores worldwide. And one of the key things about these stores is that they are all quite large. So leasing those stores is quite expensive. And the company has today announced it wants to close about a third of those stores. So very bad news for commercial landlords. And we've continued to see quite weak performance in property funds that are heavily exposed to these retail stores. Yeah, it just seems to show again, doesn't it, the sort of the pressure really that fast fashion around the world is under. It does, exactly. And we've also had bad news today from Miss Selfridge. So Philip Green's company, Miss Selfridge, has reported a £17.5 million loss today for the year. And that's following the closure of its flagship store on Oxford Circus earlier this year. So more bad news here for the retail sector. Well, thanks to Rachel Winter from Killick. And uh, just to confirm that about 350 stores for Forever 21 expected to close worldwide. Time to just whiz you through some of the numbers as well before we get back to Morocco. And in London, our 100 share index is a little moved at the moment at 7,426. Similar story really early on for the Dow. It's currently up 0.3% at 26,912. And just to mark your cards for tomorrow's World Business Report, the team are going to be taking an in-depth look at the future of food and alternative agriculture, everything from robotic precision to vertical farming. So don't miss that one on World Business Report tomorrow. Um, let's head back over to Morocco and uh, join Matt Davis back in the sunshine and see if he's found one of those camel burgers yet, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Not yet, but there it is on the menu. Welcome back to Marrakesh. Now, let's talk track and trains. Africa's first high-speed train was open to the public in Morocco at the end of last year. The project has cost more than $2 billion, with just under half of that coming from the French government, much of the rest of the funding being provided by Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. Known as Al Borak, which means a horse with wings, it aims to cut journey times in half between Tangier in the north and Casablanca. My colleague Nora Fakim set off hot foot to catch this high-speed train. I'm here in Tangiers, Morocco's industrial hub, and this station is huge. I can see palm trees alongside this glass-fronted station. In front of me, I can see skyscrapers of four-star hotels and a newly built shopping mall. This city has developed tremendously compared to a few years ago when I used to visit regularly. And part of the reason for this development has been to accommodate Morocco's brand new high-speed train so that it can go from here, where it's not far from Tangier's port, 
all the way to the economic capital of Casablanca. I'm on the high-speed train and it's going at its full speed of 200 miles per hour. But it's only on this stretch between Kinitra, near the capital city of Rabat, and Tangiers. However, from Kinitra to the economic city of Casablanca, the TGV runs at half of its top speed. So, is it really worth it? Well, I take the um, TGV mainly because it's quicker, first of all. Secondly, because it's affordable, so it's uh, very reasonable priced. Um, and of course, it gets you uh, to Tangiers within a, set, a certain set of time, and it's uh, reliable as well. So uh, that's the reason why we take the TGV all the time. The ticket of a TGV train is around $10 more expensive than the traditional train, which has been running since the 1960s, and it's still used by many people. But the government says that the TGV is a project which makes Morocco shine in Africa. However, critics say the high-speed train is a waste of money. Salma Bushiba, who's a civil activist and was part of the group Stop TGV, says it's just a vanity project for the elite. I think that it's not a project uh, that contributes to inclusive development in Morocco because it widens inequalities between the regions. It doesn't take into consideration priorities such as education, healthcare and culture that we are in desperate need of. So I'm now arriving in Casablanca and personally I felt that there wasn't much of a difference to getting the ordinary train when I went from Kinitra to here. But let's see what other passengers at the station think. Yes, I think it's worth the money. I mean, it depends on where the investment goes. Will it be Morocco or the foreign country? But I think for Morocco, it's really worth it. I use the TGV in Europe and it's three times cheaper here. It's a good deal and it always seems full, so it feels like a good investment. Moroccans aren't ready for this yet. It's really expensive and we aren't ready to take the plunge. Moroccans are used to the train, but not the TGV. But that will change. It's still in its first year. For the time being, it's still very much for the elite. That's what Moroccans think. And also, you've got to buy tickets online, and most Moroccans don't know how to do that. The company that runs the train, ONCF, had originally agreed to talk to us, but declined to do so at the last minute. And locally, there has been some controversy surrounding the project and the money that's been spent on it, especially in a country where illiteracy and poverty rates remain high. That's Nora Fakim reporting there. And Nora is with us now. Nora, you were the BBC's correspondent here in Morocco for yeah. two years, but you left seven years ago. Yep. And while you've been back and forth. So what's changed in the last few years? Well, Matt, what I've noticed now is that more and more people are speaking in English. French and Arabic are the official languages, but Moroccans are realising that English helps people get better access to the job market and it's good for international trade and business. Mohamed Baroudi from the City Tea Company, based here in Marrakesh, is still with us. Mohamed, in terms of uh, English becoming more prevalent in Moroccan society and business, what, what have you seen? Yeah, I think that it's, um, it, it became a necessity. And uh, what I noticed around me is that many Moroccan companies were trying to export worldwide, were, uh, uh, were struggling with this because the founders, the managers, were only French-speaking. And they were not equipped to find markets beyond France. And uh, now I think the new generation of managers know that the world is uh, bigger than France and that you can look for clients everywhere in the world. But you need to have English as a tool to, to do that. And in your own company, um, you don't actually employ senior managers who can't speak English. Do you? Exactly, we don't employ senior manager, managers, even middle managers now, without a, a, a minimum level of, uh, of uh, English. Uh, we export worldwide, we import also from, or from Asia, from all over the world. So without English, it's not possible to have a, a career in our company. Do you think the government is taking this on board and kind of introducing more English into uh, schools and universities and this sort of thing? Yeah, we see uh, we see a political will to develop English into uh, higher education. It's very complex to change uh, a big and uh, how can I say a big system and complex system as an education system to switch completely to France. And I think it will be dangerous to do it quickly. But uh, at the end of the day, we see that at least in higher education, English is more uh, prevalent.
Mohamed, thanks very much. Nora, what, what, what else has changed here in Morocco? Um, another thing uh, which has changed is that more and more women are becoming financially independent. Women are getting married later. I've been meeting more and more women who have their own businesses and who live by themselves, even if they're not married. So if you're a woman in Morocco, this is it's, it's, it's a good, basically, it's a good time for, to be a woman in Morocco. Things are changing quite rapidly. Yeah, things are changing. Obviously, you know, Morocco, I always see it like it's, it's a country between the West and the East, and it's it's straddling identity between modernity and you know cons uh, tradi traditions. So, for example, you know, a few days ago, uh, thousands of women spoke out about having sex outside marriage and abortion, which are both illegal acts in Morocco. And this was to show solidarity with the Moroccan journalist Hajar Daisouni, who's been jailed for both acts. So, Moroccan women are speaking out, you know. That's great, Nora. Thanks very much. My thanks to Mohamed Baroudi. And uh, on Thursday, we'll be looking at tourism here. It's a major part of the Moroccan economy and supports something in the order of two million jobs. We'll be delving into the souks at the heart of the old city here in Marrakesh, and we'll be saddling up at a posh hotel. It's one of the few I've heard of which has a stud farm attached, breeding magnificent Arab horses. So please join me then, and don't forget, there is always a podcast available to download. Just search on your favorite app for BBC World Business Report. That's it for this edition of World Business Report from Marrakesh. Thanks for listening.